Welcome to the September Alltown Case of the Month. For anyone new to the series, each case highlights clinical examples where Alltown helped take better care of patients. As always, email me with any questions or concerns at gzana.iu.edu. This case was originally seen at IU Ball Hospital by Dr. Ryan Wallace, who was assisted by Dr. Gregory Taylor, who performed the initial Alltown assessment. Additional images were obtained by Dr. Evans, the resident, and his attending physician, Dr. Kennedy. The case starts with an 88-year-old male presenting to the emergency department complaining of sudden onset of vision loss in his right eye. He described this as painless and used a curtain-like description of the vision loss. He reported this occurred at approximately 9 p.m. the night before, yet waited until the morning to come in because he thought it would get better. His vitals were documented in triage and found to be reassuring. He had an extensive medical history with the most pertinent being highlighted in the slide. His neurologic example is found to be remarkable for isolated blurry vision to the right eye. He was documented to have a normal conjunctiva and sclera, yet his vision was severely affected, and visual acuity testing was unable to be obtained. The differential for painless vision loss is one thing all of you know well, and we won't cover the full differential in detail. This list is not comprehensive, yet it does provide specific causes of painless vision loss that can be easily assessed using ultrasound. And as you guessed, ultrasound was utilized to evaluate the eye in this patient. Ultrasound of the eye is incredibly easy to perform and extremely high yield given the superficial, fluid-filled quality of the eye. If this is something you are not familiar with, I strongly encourage you to incorporate the skill into the management of your patients. As a review, this is a simplified image showing ocular anatomy as we see it on ultrasound. Starting most superficial, we see the cornea, the anterior chamber, the iris, the lens, the vitreous, the retina, and finally the optic nerve sheath. The first structure image was the affected eye. Given the curtain-like description of the vision loss, the vitreous was specifically analyzed looking for hemorrhage, vitreal detachment, or retinal detachment. The physicians decided to utilize color foe after noting the posterior chamber did not display echogenicity concerning for pathology. In this image, they were concerned for decreased color flow in the back of the eye. The evidence behind utilizing color flow to determine pathology is quite limited and not well defined. However, the physicians compared the affected eye to the good eye. Here we can see in the good eye that the color flow in the area of the optic nerve sheath and retina is more pronounced and easily identified. Given the concerns for vascular the etiology of the patient's symptoms, the team decided to increase the gain and really focus on the optic nerve sheath. The clip allows us to visualize the anatomy of the eye. We can clearly see the anterior chamber, the iris, the lens, the vitreous, and the retina. Additionally, good visualization of the optic nerve sheath was obtained. Once this was performed, a pathognomonic finding was noted that explained the patient's symptoms. That finding is known as the retrobulbar spot sign. The retrobulbar spot sign represents embolic obstruction within the retinal artery. It is the bright echogenic foci within the optic nerve sheath. This finding confirms the diagnosis of a central retinal artery occlusion. I included additional examples from a recent case series reviewing central retinal artery occlusion in which our very own Dr. Rob Ferry is a co-author. These images farther exemplify the easily identifiable echogenic focus at the back of the eye within the optic nerve sheath. Once the retrobulbar spot sign was identified, Drs. Wallace and Taylor arranged for transfer given the need for ophthalmology consultation. Upon arrival to the transfer center, ophthalmology did evaluate and the emergency department performed a dilated exam. Ophthalmology visualized a plaque during fundoscopic examination consistent with the ultrasound findings and documented signs of retinal ischemia. The patient was consulted in neurology as well where they gave recommendations for risk factor modification given his multiple vascular comorbidities. He was discharged the next day with minimal improvement in his affected eye. I wanted to include this figure from the previously mentioned case series because I think it simplifies and explains a complex process. As we reviewed previously, RBBS stands for retrobulbar spot sign. This is important because its presence essentially confirms the cause for the acute vision loss is secondary to a thromboembolic source. The bright appearance of the spot sign likely represents a dense calcified cholesterol plaque from either the carotid vessels or the valves of the heart. As you can imagine, this dense calcified clot is unlikely to respond to thrombolytic therapy. Thromboembolic occlusion is thought to be the cause for two-thirds of cases of central retinal artery occlusion, and plaque from the carotid artery is thought to be the most common cause. Additionally, the finding represents a process that is not consistent with the pathophysiology of an arteritis process. 
extended work up to include temporal arteritis is essentially unneeded if a retrobulbar spot sign is identified. I think the first only point is the importance of having skill with ultrasound to help evaluate patients with vision complaints. I would argue most of you, even with limited ocular ultrasound experience, can provide better information with ultrasound than your non-dilated ophthalmoscopic examination. If you want a review of retinal detachments, please go back and watch the January ultrasound case of the month. The second learning point is that a retrobulbar spot sign can identify the cause of a central retinal artery occlusion. This information can impact both management and diagnostic decisions, as well as subsequent discussions with consultants. Sadly, even with this help in management, these patients universally don't do well, even with aggressive therapies. The retina is an extremely metabolically active tissue and develops irreversible changes quite early to ischemia. About 80% of patients diagnosed with central retinal artery occlusion have a final visual acuity of 20 over 400 or worse. Thanks for watching. Continue using all the time to help take care of your patients. And as always, email me with any questions or concerns.